I, sh- I wanted to do a message this morning. Actually, I really didn't want to do this message on Sunday morning. This is more like a Wednesday night message. But I figured, you know, God like laid on my heart when we were away. I was praying about, you know, what to speak on this Sunday. And he kind of laid this on my heart. We all know. How many people know, you know, you've got this guy out there saying that the world's going to come to an end. Right? <clears throat> well, it didn't. And uh, he said it was going to happen last, I think last Saturday. And, uh, and it didn't. And there's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a lot of confusion about that. Now, this guy, you know, his name is Harold Camping. And if this guy weren't rich, he'd be like some, some nut on a street corner somewhere with a sign that says, you know, he's, he's very deluded. He's very, he doesn't understand things. He, uh, he uh, has, you know, he, he, he supposedly says he studied God's Word and all this other stuff. But if he studied God's Word, there's some things he would know. Number one, nobody knows when the end is going to come. Number two, it doesn't matter when the end is going to come because we have, you know, things we have to be doing until it comes. And number three, the, you know, there really is not going to be an end to the, to the world. There's going to be a, a, a regeneration, but the world is not going to come to an end. Okay, and, and if anybody that would read the Scripture would know that. Now, God kind of laid on my heart that this morning, you know, I, I said last week, if you remember last week, I said that the main thing is not the end times. The main thing is the blood of Jesus and the cross of Christ. And what he did for us on the cross. That's got to be our emphasis. And when we, when we are about our father's business out there in the world and, you know, we run into people and we witness to them, telling them about what we think about the end times probably isn't going to do a whole lot to save them. But if we tell them what Jesus did for them, that's the main thing. But this morning I wanted to equip you a little bit and give you an outline. So, you, so when somebody would come to you and say, hey, you know, this guy said the earth is going to come to, uh, you know, the, the, the world's going to come to an end. Now he says it's going to be in like October 11th, you know. So, you know, get your, you know, go out and buy anything you want to before October 11th because you won't have to pay for it. But no, don't do that. Uh, so, you know, people are mixed up about this kind of stuff. So, uh, this morning I wanted, to, I wanted to give a little teaching called uh, Outline for the End Times, okay? Now listen, there's some things you need to understand. Number one, uh, if I make it work, okay, when we talk about prophecy and we talk about the end times and we talk about the end of the world, it says in uh, Revelation chapter 19 and verse 10 that the spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus. Whenever we start talking about prophecy, it's not about, you know, the United States. It's not about it. It's about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. What we do, what we learn, what we say as believers needs to be focused and centered on the work and the person of Jesus Christ. It's all about Jesus. It's like a foundational thing. Okay? Now, as we lay a foundation, I want you to open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 23. And this is just all kind of introductory. Uh, In Matthew chapter 23, we're going to read the very last two verses of that that chapter. Okay? Uh, The setting is just a couple days before the crucifixion. It's the last, it's the Passion Week. Jesus is in the temple teaching. Okay? And if you look at the very beginning of Matthew chapter 23, it says that Jesus started speaking to the multitudes and to his disciples. He started giving a discourse about, you know, what was going on. And his, in his discourse, he was talking about the, uh, how, how the nation of Israel was going to reject him. And he was upbraiding the scribes and the Pharisees and the leaders of the nation of Israel for the fact that they are rejecting uh, the cornerstone. The, the, the Bible says the, the stone that the builders rejected. You know, prophetic things are all through the Bible, Old Testament and New Testament. All kinds of passages of Scripture in the prophets and in the, and in the law and in the New Testament speak of what's going to happen at the end. Okay? Well, Jesus, in chapter 23 of Matthew, is upbraiding the leadership of Israel because they're, they're going to reject him. And he says uh, in chapter uh, 23, and look at verse 37. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you that kill the prophets and stone them which are sent unto you, how often when I have gathered your children together, even as a hen gathers her chickens under her wings, and you would not. Jesus is saying, you know what, I've, I've, I've preached to you, I've ministered to you, I've done miracles in your midst. There have been prophets that have been sent to you speaking of me. All these things have been happening, and you're still rejecting me. You're still being hard-hearted and being stiff-necked and rejecting me. And he says in verse 38, Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. For I say unto you in verse 39, You shall not see me henceforth, till you shall say, Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. Now what Jesus is saying here, okay, 
Ah, uh, I did it wrong. Okay. okay. For I shall say, you shall not see me henceforth, till you shall say, blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. All right? You have to forgive my, my technical inability. Now, what, what Jesus is saying, when he was giving this discourse to the scribes and Pharisees, when he came to the very end, he said, listen, he says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave this temple, I'm walking out of this temple, and you're not going to see me in this temple again until you welcome me as your Messiah. And essentially, that's, I'm paraphrasing, I'm kind of putting those words in a way, you know, a different kind of way, but that's what he's saying. This thing is, blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. That's a messianic proclamation. He said, the next time you see me in this temple, you're going to be greeting me as your Messiah. That's what he said. Now, that sounds, to us, we know what happened. We know that Jesus was crucified. And that he went away and he told his disciples he was going away. But when he said this, his disciples didn't have a clue of what was going to happen. They didn't know. He told them, but they didn't listen to him. They were convinced that Jesus was the Messiah. And he was going to come and set everything straight. And he was going to come and, and bring the kingdom back to Israel, which was predicted in the Old Testament and all the prophets. So they believed that Jesus was, you know, when he said this, his disciples, in my mind, in my thinking, his disciples probably got pretty excited because they said, hey... You know, Jesus was going in the temple all the time. Man, the next time, he's saying that the next time he comes to this temple, it's going to be, they're going to welcome him, they're going to greet him as Messiah. So his disciples probably got to thinking, this is it, boys. This is it. Get ready. Because Jesus is getting ready to do what the Old Testament said he was going to do. The New Testament had not been written yet. We didn't have the books of the New Testament. They were just going back to what was said in Isaiah and Ezekiel and Daniel and all those, all those prophets. So they're getting ready to welcome, you know, Jesus as Messiah. They're getting, they're getting excited because this is what they have been, they have been following him for like three and a half years. And this is what they were waiting for. The establishment of the kingdom, the Messiah, the King of Israel coming back and sitting on the throne of the day. That's what they were waiting for. Okay, now in the next chapter, chapter 24, it says, And Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and as... Disciples came to him to show him the buildings of the temple. In other words, if you just get this picture, Jesus had just made this scathing rebuke to the scribes and Pharisees, said that the next time he was going to come to the temple, was going to be, they were going to greet him as Messiah. So as they were leaving, his disciples, and this is the picture I get in my mind, his disciples were saying, hey, Jesus, look at this temple. It's, it was a beautiful temple. It was built by a guy named King Herod. King Herod wasn't such a nice guy. And King Herod didn't give two hoots about God. He just liked people to think, you know, he was a nice guy. So he built this big temple, and there was a massive temple, great stones if you read about it. It was better, you know, bigger and greater than Solomon's temple. <clears throat> and it was like his disciples were saying, Jesus, this is it. This is where you're going to reign. This is where you're going to sit on the throne of David. This is, this is your place. And they were like excited. And Jesus dropped a bombshell. Jesus was always dropping bombshells. He said to them, you see all these things? Verily I say unto you, there shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. Jesus said, you think this temple is such a great place? It's coming down. Well, it took, you know, it took, I don't know, 20 years to build. He said, it's coming down. And his disciples, their, their draw must have dropped. I mean, I'm just picturing this in my mind. You understand, I'm reading some things into this the way I see it. His disciples must have said, hey, Jesus. You know, they must have thought to themselves as they were walking out of the city. They must have thought to themselves, we don't get it. Jesus, you're talking about coming back here, and you know they're going to greet you as blessed as he who comes in the name of the Lord. Now you tell us that the, the whole place is coming down. Well, they got to the Mount of Olives, and his disciples asked him a question. It says, as they sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming in the end of the world? What's this going to happen, Jesus? When's the temple coming down? And what's, what are we going to look for to see your coming and the end of the world? This, world? this word world here in the Greek, it's really the word eon. It's really the word for age, like the end of the age. In other words, they're saying, Jesus, when's the temple going to get torn down? And what are we looking for to tell us when things are going to change? When you're going to come and be the king. Have the messianic kingdom, God's kingdom on earth. They're asking these questions. They're pretty good questions. People have been asking those questions for a long time. And they've been trying to figure out, like this guy here, you know, that he came up with last week, that he was wrong. And they've been, they try to figure out, try to figure out when it's going to come. And Jesus began to give a message to them here in Matthew chapter 24. We're not going to read through all of Matthew chapter 24 because it's a long thing. 
and, and we're just going to give you an outline this morning. We can't really go into great detail because we'd be here till you know, supper time. And we don't want to be here that long. Or maybe even longer. But the thing is, we just want to give you an outline. So when you, when you run into one of your friends and say, Hey, I hear the world's going to come to an end. You can say, No, it's not. And you can tell them why. Okay? Now Jesus begins to give what is called the Olivet Discourse. And it's called that because it was given on the Mount of Olives, which makes sense. Okay? So it was called the Olivet Discourse. And, and just to sum it up, here's what he says. Okay? Uh, here's what, here's what you're, you're to look for. Now, he doesn't give us a time, but he tells us what we can look for. We're to look for false Christs. False Christ. We haven't had many of them have. Okay? False Christ. Uh, political upheaval. Okay, in the world, wars and, wars and rumors of wars. Natural disasters, my goodness, we've had enough of them. You know, uh, earthquakes, famines and diseases, persecution of the faithful and false prophets. I don't know, at the time we're living, then we got lots of them, I guess, you know, false prophets. Okay? Uh, and most of them are, you know, disguise themselves as Christian ministers. <laughs> you know, I mean, if somebody comes out of a, a new age occult thing and gives a false prophecy, I can say they're nuts. But when somebody comes along with a caller or with a praise the Lord, hallelujah, and they give a false prophecy, everybody has a tendency to want to believe them. But everything has to be checked out with God's Word. Okay? Now, Jesus, if you read through this passage, and I encourage you, when you get some time, when you go home, forget, you know, forget the hockey game. Read, read chapter 24 of Matthew, all right? And, and chapter 25, because Jesus describes the things that are going to happen, and uh, he says that all these things that we're seeing like now, the false Christ and the, and, the, and the wars and rumors, they're the beginning of sorrows. I heard one guy say, oh, we're living in Revelation. No, we're not. I don't want to live in the time of Revelation. We'll talk about that in a minute. We're not living in that time. We're living in a time when I believe we are in the beginning of sorrows. The worst... Tornado year ever recorded. Hundreds, thousands of people displaced. Did you see a picture of that hospital? A hospital just tore up. You know, you can't stop water and you can't stop wind. Natural disaster. Somebody says that's the wrath of God. That's not the wrath of God. It might be God trying to get our attention. It might be God sending a warning, but it's not His wrath. We'll talk about that in a minute too. It's the beginning of sorrows, okay? Now, outline for the end times. Facts concerning His second coming. And the, again, these things we can log in our, in our mind. Uh, the gospel is going to be preached to all nations. And, and we're living in a time that through internet and uh, radio and TV and so forth, all over the world the gospel is going forth in different languages. There will be a, a temple in Jerusalem. That hasn't happened yet. But there's going to be a temple in Jerusalem. And it's going to be built upon the mount you know, where that dome is right now. That thing's coming down. There's going to be a new temple there. That's where it was. It's going to be built where it's supposed to be built, okay? Now, we're going to see that, and I particularly don't want, maybe I don't want to be around to see it built, okay? But that's going to happen. Uh, false Christ will, doing signs and wonders, miracles, you know, we've had enough of that. And, and uh, no, one, now, no one knows the time. Can we please log this into our mind? You know, it, it's bad enough when you get some guy that gets on TV or some guy with a lot of money promotes himself and says the end is near. You know, and he'll give you a date. But what about the people that follow him? That's what I wouldn't miss. That's what I, I don't understand. The people can't, you know, if, and I said this last week, if I stood up here and say, hey, the world is going to come to an end next Thursday at 7 o'clock, you ought to leave. And go find some other place to go to church. Because that doesn't, that's just, that's just, Jesus said, no man knows the time or the hour. Now, if Jesus said that, I'll take his word for it, okay? Nobody knows the time. And the world, when it does come, the world will not be expecting it. They won't be sitting on rooftops waiting for, for it to happen. Matter of fact, Jesus said it was like, as in the days of Noah. They were marrying, giving a marriage, eating, drinking, just having a good time, just living their lives. And the rain came. And the flood came. They weren't expecting it. They should have expected it because Noah preached the Bible for 120 years, but nobody listened to him. But they weren't expecting it. When, when, when the time comes for, for these end time things to begin, the world's going to think everything's just going along just fine. And then things are going to start happening. Now, that's just foundational, Okay. That's just the just introductory. I'm going to give you an outline for the end times. I'm not going to tell you when Jesus is coming back because I don't know. And I don't particularly want to know. But I'm going to give you an outline. I'm going to show you how things are going to happen, how they're going to come down. So when somebody comes up to you and said they just heard some guy on TV say the world's coming in 2012, I guess that's the next big one now. You know, the Mayan calendar and everything. It's all oh, 2012. They made a movie about it. It's not going to happen. 
I'll tell you right here, it's not going to happen. You can bet on it. Don't bet on it. I don't believe in gambling. But if you, if you do and you want to bet some money, you want some money, go ahead. It's not happening, all right? Now, outline for the end times. I'm going to give you just, just some things that you can maybe log in your mind, okay? And I don't usually do PowerPoint Sunday morning, but I thought it was good for this morning that you could kind of, you know. All right? Now, number one, the first thing that's going to happen is the rapture slash resurrection. Now, we've been hearing a lot about the rapture. I think I have some water up here. Okay. Everybody talks about the rapture. And they seem to equate the rapture with the end of the world. The rapture is not the end of the world. The rapture is just the beginning of things. I put up their rapture slash resurrection because they're both the same thing. We believe as Christians, we believe in the resurrection of the dead. That everybody lives forever in a body somewhere. The righteous live forever in their body in the presence of God. And those who have rejected His salvation live forever in their body in a lake of fire. But everybody lives forever in a body somewhere. When God created us, He gave us a body. That wasn't a mistake. He gave us a body. So, rapture, resurrection. In First Thessalonians, and some of you guys know this by heart. I might be preaching to the choir. That's all right. First Thessalonians chapter 4. And it's one of those passages that if you like to memorize Scripture, this is a good one to memorize. Because there's some folks that deny this stuff. But listen. The Apostle Paul writes to the church at Thessalonica. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep. That means dead. There are people in Thessalonica. The, the believers, Paul planted a church there. He started a work there. And the, and the gospel spread there. And some of the believers there had passed away. And, and the ones who were left behind thought maybe they were going to miss Jesus. So Paul wrote this letter to answer that question. He says, I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, do you believe that? I believe that. Even so, them which sleep in Jesus will God bring with Him. Okay? For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord. And again, there's so much detail here, but we're just trying to just lay the, just a basic outline. With this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent or go before them which are asleep. I'm kind of translating the King James into, okay. For the Lord himself, now listen, for the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God. And what's going to happen first? The dead in Christ shall rise first. That's resurrection. That means graves will open up. That means people that, believers that have died throughout the centuries, throughout the millennia, their bodies will come up from wherever they are. And it won't be the old decrepit bodies that wore out, but they'll come up new, refreshed, young, whatever, you know, we don't completely understand. But perfect bodies, the same kind of body Jesus had when He came out of the grave after three days, bodies will rise up and they'll be reunited with the spirits of those who believe. And they'll live forever in those bodies. That's the rapture. That's the resurrection part. That's the beginning of the first resurrection. There are really two resurrections. Okay, I'm talking about the first one. That's the beginning of the first resurrection, and uh, and, he, and he goes on and he says this in verse seventeen. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. So the first thing, the next thing that's going to happen in God's prophetic time clock is the rapture slash resurrection. When's it going to happen? I don't have a clue. It could happen right now. And if it happened right now, I'd probably be pretty happy about it. But it might not happen for another 500 years. I don't know when it's going to happen. It seems like it's going to happen soon. But it's really not up to me to know that. The next thing that's going to happen is the resurrection slash rapture of the resurrection of the dead and the rapture of the body of Christ. That means that all over the world, graves are going to open up. Can you just imagine that? It's spooky enough when you see it in the movie, but this is going to happen for real. Graves are, people are going to come up out of graves. And a whole bunch of people are going to disappear. I'm going to be one of them. I, hope, I know I am. I'm going to say, I hope I know I am. Because why? Because my faith in the blood of Jesus Christ. I'm not going to get raptured because I'm a preacher. There's going to be a whole lot of preachers going to be left behind here. I don't want to be one of them. And all the preachers scratch their heads and say, what happened? They didn't teach me this in seminary. There's going to be a rapture. 
People, people, there are going to be bodies raising up from the graves opening up and bodies coming up and, and going up. And we which are alive and remain in uh, uh, 1 Corinthians, it says we're going to be changed in the moment in the twinkling of an eye. This body that's getting old and it's hurting and it's really sore. And I know some of us are really sore from yesterday from running around with the kids. You know, we're kind of aching. And, you know, it's going to be changed, a perfected body. And it's going to be, and, and we're going to forever be with the Lord. Jesus is going to come to the air. He's not going to sit foot on the, on the ground yet. It says it right here. That he's going to come and we're going to meet him in the air and forever be with him. Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Won't have to worry about paying my city tax anymore. <laughs> you know, won't have to worry about getting the steps replaced out there. Don't All right. So, it's, so that's coming. That's the next thing that's going to happen in God's prophetic time clock. Okay. The rapture slash resurrection. All right. And there's a whole lot more. We can go into so much about that. Again, I just want to give you an outline this morning. Okay. Now, the next thing that's going to happen after that is wrath. It's wrath. It doesn't begin with an R, but it sounds like an R. <laughs> it's wrath. Wrath. Who's wrath? God's wrath. You mean God's mad? Oh, God's so mad. He's, do you think, if, if you see something going on that makes you angry, if you pick up the paper and you read about injustice, or you read about some of these people doing all these creepy things, and it makes you mad. What do you think it does to God? When you read about what's going on in, 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 in the, uh, the, the capitals of, our, of the nations of the world, and it makes you mad, do you, make, do you think it makes him mad? God's been storing up wrath for a long time. He's been getting mad for a long time. Matter of fact, it says somewhere that it's, his cup is like overflowing. You know, it's starting to spill over the brim. After the rapture, after, after the resurrection, we have the wrath of God. Now, if you want to be, read about the wrath of God, you've got to read the whole book of Revelation. We're not going to do that this morning. <laughs> we'll be here for a while. Like I said, when you go home and you get bored, pick up your Bible, read Revelation chapter 4 through to the end. And, and you'll find out about when God begins to pour His wrath out. You see, this is why I said that what's going on in the world today, the tornadoes and, the, and all the disasters, the floods and everything is happening, and the wars and rumors of wars, that's just the beginning of sorrows. See, those are natural disasters, or the effects of man. But when God pours His wrath out, it's going to be supernatural. If you read the judgments in Revelation, the, the trumpets and the vials and the, and, you know, the, the seals, and you read about them, we're, we're talking about supernatural things happening. Things beyond just the natural. The natural disasters are bad enough, but when God begins to pour His wrath, you know, the people that got hit by the tornado, someday they'll rebuild. When God pours His wrath out, there's no rebuilding. We haven't seen God's wrath. Thank God. The Bible says that, and the, Bible says that the believers are not appointed to God's wrath. It's bad enough we have to put up with the wrath of you know, a fallen creation, the wrath of a crazy government, and, but we're not appointed to God's wrath. So, the next thing that's going to happen after, after the rapture and the resurrection. Here's the scenario, and again, just scratching the surface, okay? We all, heard of, we all have heard the term Antichrist. You've heard that term, haven't you? Antichrist. We know that after the rapture, now there have been many Antichrists in the world. The spirit of Antichrist has been going on for a long time, because the spirit of Antichrist is Satan, the devil. He's been around for a long time. So we know that the spirit of Antichrist has been working, and there have been many Antichrists in the world, if you read history, great maniacal, demonic, okay? But after, there's sometime after the rapture, and we don't know how long it's going to be, if it could be a day or a week or a month or a year, we don't know. But sometime after the, the, the rapture resurrection is going to come uh, this leader. And if you read the book of Daniel, you know, on our website, we have download, you can download uh, MP3s of the studies in the book of Daniel and studies in the, in the Revelation. So you can read about this and hear about this more in depth. <clears throat> but this, uh, Daniel says that there will arise a one, a little horn, an antichrist, the antichrist. He's going to make a deal with Israel for seven years. So how do you know that? Daniel chapter 8, 9, and 10, you can read those chapters. He's going to make a deal with Israel for seven years. Halfway through that seven-year period, he's going to break the deal. And he's going to end up, you know, the, the world's going to end up in turmoil. It's during that seven-year period that we call... Jacob's trouble or uh, the great tribulation that God will begin to pour his wrath out supernaturally you can read about that in Revelation from chapter 4 to chapter 19 okay that's 
The next thing is going to happen. All right? Now, after the seven-year period where God's wrath is poured out, we have His return. And you can turn with me to Revelation chapter 19. And uh, we'll start with verse 11. Actually, we'll start with verse 10. The Apostle John received these visions while he was in a, in, on, on a, a, a prison island called the Isle of Patmos. And he was, he was uh, being spoken to by an angel in verse 10. He says, And I fell at his feet to worship him. And he said unto me, See thou do it not. I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Any prophecy that doesn't talk about Jesus is false. I don't care if it comes true. If somebody claims to be a prophet and they make a prophecy and it comes true and they're not talking about Jesus, they're a false prophet. Okay? And there's a lot more to that. But Okay, verse 11. Now this is what John saw. We're, we, we've talked about the rapture of the, of the church and the resurrection of the righteous dead, the wrath of God being poured out. The third thing that's going to happen is His return. Verse 11. And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he does judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. Listen, when, when, when Christ comes back, it's not going to be in secret. When Christ comes back, it's not going to be as, you know, a loving baby. You know, we always think it's loving baby in a manger, Jesus, you know. We, he was the Lamb of God the first time he came. When he comes back the second time, he's going to be the Lion of the tribe of Judah. He's not going to come back. To, to bring to express his love on the cross like he did the first time, but he's going to come back to show the wrath of God to a lost and dying and Christ rejecting world. People ought to wake up. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him. I'm going to be one of them. I was never in the army down here, but I'm going to be in that one. Because all the ones who were raptured, or the ones who were resurrected, you know, before this happened, at the rapture resurrection, they're going to be in the army of God. And we're not going to be spirits floating around. We're going to have bodies. This is going to be a literal, real thing. Just like Jesus, when He rose from that dead, He wasn't some ghost that was floating around, but He rose with a body, a flesh and bone body. That's what we're going to have. He says, And the armies in heaven followed Him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. <laughs> Miss Kathy couldn't get me on the horse yesterday. <laughs> we had, when we had, when we had the kiss, we went up to uh, Kathy. Kathy has a horse. And she said, Pastor, you're going to get on the horse. I said, I ain't going to get on the horse. <laughs> I have some bad stories about horses I ain't going to tell. But <laughs> All right. Beautiful horse. Beautiful horse. Maybe someday, Kathy, I'll, maybe someday I'll, I'll get up the nerve when nobody's looking and get on that horse. All right. Verse 15. And out of the mouth goes a sharp sword. This is Christ's return. That with it he should smite the nations and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. This is after seven years of the, of the, of Satan's Christ ruling the world. After seven years of mankind trying to do everything the way he thinks he ought to do it. After seven years of a Christless, godless, uh, 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 humanistic centered society uh, uh, trying to come together. After seven years of, of everything evil being looked upon as good, the righteous one, the righteous judge, Jesus Christ is going to return. And He's going to come back, not as a babe in a manger, but as an angry, wrathful God. Because God is angry at what's going on in this world. And when He comes back, it says, Out of His mouth goes a sharp sword, and with it He should smite the nations. The Word of God. Listen, this Word of God is powerful. It says, He shall rule them with a rod of iron, and He treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And He has on His vesture and on His thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. This is, listen, this is, this is coming. He's not coming back to destroy the world. He's coming back to cleanse the world. His return is the third thing that's going to happen. After his return, and there, there's so much more. Please study this. Study this, okay? After his return is going to be his reign. 
He is going to reign as the king of the world. No, he's going to reign as the king of the universe. And he's not going to reign from Washington, D.C. He's not going to sit in the Oval Office. He's not going to reign from the Kremlin. He's not going to reign from, you know, Buckingham Palace. He's going to reign from Jerusalem. That's God's center of the earth. That's what they're fighting over right now. That's what they've been fighting over for a couple thousand years. That's where Jesus is going to come and uh, return. That's where He's going to establish His throne and His kingdom. Why do you think, why do you think they want to get the Jews out of Jerusalem? Because they figure if we can get them out of there, Jesus can't come back there. Jesus is going to go back to Jerusalem. And He's going to sit there as King. Look at Revelation chapter 20. And starting at verse 1. And I'm, I'm skipping over a lot. Please do yourself a favor and read it. Verse, uh, chapter 20 and verse... Uh, we'll, we'll start with verse 1. And I saw an angel come down from heaven having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, the old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. Boy, hallelujah. I wish, I'd, I wish he'd start now. You know, there's so many people who try to, they spend their time binding Satan. Man, if it took these powerful angels, sometimes we think, man, I'll just bind Satan. You better be filled with the Holy Ghost before you start binding anything. Satan's a powerful being. Not more powerful than our God. Greater is he who's in us than he who's in the world. Okay? So, I mean, you know, anointed with the Holy Spirit of God. We, got, we, you know, we, don't, we don't have to be afraid of Satan, but you better make sure you're filled with the Spirit. If you start dealing with Satan, not filled with the Spirit, you're going to get beat up, all right? But listen to what happens. They tie him up. They bind him. And they throw him in this pit. They cast him in the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled. A thousand years. That's a millennium. We believe in a millennial reign of Jesus Christ. Some folks think, some folks try to relegate this stuff to like history and say, well, you know, the church has been around for so long and da, 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 da. No, no. You can't have a kingdom without a king. Okay, so, no more, until the thousand years should be fulfilled, and after that he must be loosed for a season. I always wondered why, but, well, he tells us why, but, okay, verse 4. And I saw thrones, and they that sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them, and I saw the souls of them who were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the, the, uh, the beast. During that seven-year time, people will be saved during that time, and they'll pay with their lives, like they did in the first century, in the Roman Empire. They'll believe... But then they'll, then they'll pay with their lives. It says here they'll be beheaded. Okay? Uh, they were the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the image, uh, uh, worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads, or in their hands they lived there and reigned with Christ a thousand years. But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that has part in the first resurrection on such the second death has no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. So what we read about now, after his return, after the rapture, resurrection, after the wrath, after his return, there's going to be a reign. Jesus Christ is going to reign on this planet for a thousand years. And we, particularly those who have lost their lives during that tribulation period, they're going to reign with him. We're going to be priests and and kings in this world. There's still going to be people living in this world that survive through the seven year period, okay? We're going to reign with Jesus. That's what the Word pro promises us. That's what it tells us. And there's a whole lot in the, in the Old Testament, in Isaiah and Ezekiel, that talks about the millennial kingdom. See, the Jews thought the millennial kingdom was going to happen right then and there. That's why his disciples got all excited when he said, you know, I'm not coming back until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They figured this is it. Well, it wasn't it then. But that time is coming, okay? So, we have, his, we have the, the rapture, resurrection, the wrath, the return, and the reign. After the reign, and this is the part that is really kind of like a terrifying part. We have retribution. Somebody says, wait a minute, wait a minute. God, God is love. God is love. He's also righteous. He's also holy. He's also just. God will judge sin. He has, we sung that song, He showed us His love. He showed His love to the world when He sent His Son, Jesus Christ, to hang on the cross. That's how God showed His love to us. If we reject that love, then we have nothing 
but retribution. Look in chapter uh, 21. I'm sorry, chapter 20, and starting at verse 11. The Apostle John writes this, he says, And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. And there was found no place for them. This is chilling to me. This is chilling to me. This is after the thousand year reign. It says, And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. I want you to hear me, really, please. Please understand this. Don't think that you're, what you do is going to impress God. God's not impressed. You could be a speaker and lead a million people to the Lord Jesus Christ. He's not impressed. There's only one thing that God's going to look for. When, when your time comes to go on into the next life, He's going to look for one thing and one thing only. Is your name written in the Lamb's book of life. There are people who can preach, who, they can preach the paint off the walls. Their names aren't written in the Lamb's book of life. There are people who can study the Word and learn the languages and everything else. Their names aren't written in the Lamb's book of life. Why? Because they've never put their faith and trust in what Jesus did on the cross, what we talked about last week. That's the main thing. Because when we come down to the part of retribution, see, we don't like to think of a loving God doing retribution, but it says right here, I'm not making this up. When it comes to the end of all things, all those who were not raptured or resurrected, uh, or, or resurrected the first time, they're going to be resurrected. And they're going to stand before the God of heaven. Just imagine that. The righteous, holy, just God is going to stand there. The same Christ that came back with a sword in His mouth and is going to be sitting on this throne. And everybody that ever lived, that's a lot of them, are going to stand before this throne. And they're going to open the books. And they're going to look, and they're going to, they're going to look at their works. You know, you could have a whole lot of good works. One sin dumps them. The Bible says if you sin in one thing, you're lost. That includes all of us. That, you know, I'd love to stand up here and tell you I, I've, I'm living a sinless, perfect life wow. until I walk out the door. <laughs> We're all sinners saved by grace. If you're not saved by the grace of God, if you're not saved by faith in Him, you're not saved. There's no in-between. You're either saved by what He did or you're lost according to what you've done. That applies to all of us. It says, I saw the dead, small and great, leaders of nations and paupers, wealthy, poor, white, black, you know, of all nations. It doesn't matter. No amount of money, no amount of power can impress God. Small and great, stand before God. And the books were opened. Oh, what a, what a horrible time this will be. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it. And death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Remember we, we read earlier, blessed are he who has no part in the second death. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to die once if the rapture doesn't happen. But I'm going to live forever with Christ because of my faith in Jesus. But for those who reject Christ, for those who reject His love, they have nothing to look forward to but this judgment where after, after spending eons in, the, in, 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 in torment, they're going to be raised from the dead and they're going to stand before the throne only to be told, Depart from me, you that work iniquity. 
and be cast into a place called the lake of fire. Some people want to say there is no hell. Well, you can say that, but it says right here there is. See, I'm just going with God's Word. Rapture, resurrection, wrath, His return, His reign, the the retribution, and finally, the restoration of all things. Look in Revelation chapter 21. And we're closing. He says, And I saw a what? A new heaven and a new earth. He's not going to fix this old one up. Just like, you know, when I got saved, He didn't just take the old man and fix him up. When you got saved, He didn't take the old man, He didn't take the old woman and try to clean him up a little bit. No. He, you are a new creature. When this time comes, there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. You know, I, well, I've thought about this and I've prayed about this. You know, the laws of physics that we understand now won't apply. I mean, it's going to be a totally new heaven and a new earth. Everything's going to be different. Everything's going to be new. He says, For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, not the old Jerusalem. It's going to be a new Jerusalem. Coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and we will, He will dwell with them, and they shall be His people, and God Himself shall be with them. What's he talking about here? The restoration of the relationship that God meant to happen in the very beginning. When God created Adam and Eve, He walked with them in the cool of the evening in the garden, and they fellowshiped. Until they sin, and they had to be separated. It's God bringing His creation back. He's bringing us back. The restoration of all things. A new heaven and a new earth. The four square city, if you read it. Again, there's, we're just really scratching the surface. Please study this. The four square city. It's as, as wide as it is high as it is long. Some people say it would be like 1,500 miles cubed. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what the distance is. I do know this much. It talks about the streets being pure gold. I mean, we can't understand. We can't fathom there's a description that we have here, but it really is it's just a very meager description. We don't have a, really don't have a clue. People have tried to draw pictures and paint pictures of what it's going to look like. But I don't think we can even begin to imagine what it's going to be like to be with God. We're going to be with Him. Like I'm with you right now, we're going to be with Him. Face to face. We're going we're gonna to dwell with Him. He's going to be our God, and we're going to be His people. Can you just put that in your mind, lock that in there? This is what we're looking for. This is what His whole purpose is. Bringing everything back to the way He meant it to be to begin with. Hallelujah! Here's the, only, here's the difference. Here's the only difference. When He created Adam and Eve, they sinned. But we who have been washed with the blood of Jesus Christ, sin has no dominion. We're no longer slaves to sin. The sin nature is no longer there. We can fellowship with God one on one. We do it now through prayer and through praying and worship and so forth. But at that time, we're going to see Him face to face. Hallelujah. And we're not going to have to be afraid of Him. We're not going to have to bring an offering or sacrifice because it was made on the cross. And we're not going to have to worry about judgment. Because that was made on the cross. That's what we're looking forward to. Yes. Do you know me? Yes.
Yes. Do you know him? Are you ready? See, here's the question. Thank you. That was the Lord. Do you know him? They ask you if you know me. I can't do anything for you. Do you know him? Because if you know him, you're ready. If you know him, if that rapture would happen today, be gone. If you know him, when he returns, you'll be coming with him. If you know him, you'll walk with him and talk with him in the midst of the four square city. That's the question. The Lord has brought an end to our message by asking you this question. Do you know Him? Do you know Him? I want to ask you to stand with me, please. Father, you've asked us the question this morning through your servant. Do we know you? We know about you. We, we've heard about you. Some of us have been sitting in church for forever and forever. We've, for a long time, we've, we've heard all about you. We've heard all about this stuff. But do we, Father, you've asked us this morning, do we know you? Are we yours? question I would ask is, do you know us? <laughs> Father, I want to pray this morning as we prepare to leave your presence. If there's one person or two person, or ten, or or however many, that would say to themselves this morning, I don't know you. I've heard about you. I've been in church. I've heard the name Jesus. I know Christmas. I know Easter. Do you know Him this morning? I want to ask you to be brave, just like these little ones were brave when they came up. If you don't know Him and you want to know Him, won't you come? Somebody start singing something. Amazing grace. If you don't know Him and you want to know Him, the sound that saved a wretch like me Once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Listen, this isn't about, you know, church. It's not about joining a church. It's not, nothing about that. It's, do you know Him? You may leave here. I may never see you again. doesn't matter. Do you know Him? We're going to sing it one more time. And sometimes I'll say, well, you know, you can do it where you sit. We'll pray. But this morning, I just, I just want to invite you to come. When we've been there 10,000 years Bright shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. Father, we thank you for your word. My prayer is, Lord, that. As we've gathered in this place this morning, not a one of us would leave here not understanding. We hope that in our own feeble way, we've been able to give an outline of the things that are coming upon this earth. Give an outline of why you've done, why all these things are happening. So that we will have an answer, a reasonable answer. Father, I pray that everybody within the sound of my voice who has heard this message, Maybe I have not got everything across exactly as I have wanted to, but Father, it's the Holy Spirit that quickens the Word to our hearts. I pray, Lord, that not one person would leave this place without 
understanding, without knowing, without being convicted in their heart that Jesus Christ is the Son of God that came to die for our sins, that our only hope of eternity in the presence of God is to have faith and trust in the blood of Jesus Christ. I hope and pray there's not a person that doesn't understand it. Hallelujah. Father, as we await your return, as we await your return, help us, Lord, be focused on you. And we give you all the praise and honor and glory. Praise God. 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 Don't